This video is sponsored by Rocket Money. Brittany Gargle's death was one that shocked the town of Saskatoon for all of the wrong reasons. But after two years of not knowing who the killer was, this case would be solved by a single selfie. And her assailant was much closer than you would believe. So, who was Brittany Gargle? Who was her killer? And how did this selfie solve her case? Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks, and welcome back to The Coffee House too. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at a case that developed over in Saskatoon. Now, as with all murder cases, there were rumours and theories on who potentially murdered Brittany. It just took investigators two years to find out. In the end, though, the killer would reveal themselves in the most stupid of ways. So, get ready for that one. By the way, I post true crime and darkly fascinating stories here weekly. So, if that does sound like your kind of thing, hit subscribe, grab a coffee, and get comfortable for the show. This is the case of Brittany Gargle. Welcome back to Canada, folks. Our case today pulls us to the southern province of Saskatchewan. Now, allow me to cover the basics here. Known as the land of living skies, Saskatchewan is a beautiful province known for its active dunes, rolling farmlands, jaw-dropping national parks, and almost infinite chain of lakes. It is considered to have an excellent quality of life, is the birthplace of Medicare, has a vibrant art and culture scene, and is filled to the brim with outdoor activities. Now, you would assume that Saskatchewan is a peaceful place to be, but actually, the province's homicide rate is more than double the national average here. But even still, our story today would leave the nation of Canada in disbelief. Moving into our story today, we are honing in on Saskatchewan's city of Saskatoon, and it's here that we could find the beautiful life of Brittany Gargoyle. Born on August the 31st, 1996, Brittany was a blessing to her parents, Susan Gargoyle and Everett Hillbum. She was known to be fiercely independent from a very young age, and was constantly competing with her three stepsisters, Courtney, Tristan, and Victoria. Now, Brittany's family were not as picture-perfect as you may have expected. Her parents would often battle, and as a young girl, her father was absent for most of her life. Her mother had her own demons to fight too, and sadly was known to struggle with addiction. But even from a very young age, Brittany was outspoken and well known to be a go-getter. Within a household of four young girls, it made sense that she felt the need to be expressive and strong-willed to stand out from the others. Despite her outspoken nature, she was also known to be quite sweet and caring. And sure, she may have been the blunt type, but she was never too harsh or negative. Living in Saskatoon, Brittany and her step-siblings took great advantage of the snowy winters and mountains. Brittany was an excellent snowboarder, and even as a teen, was often seen carving up the slopes with style and grace. During the summer, those same mountains offered spectacular hiking trails, and Brittany was no stranger to those either. She loved to hike, and would often camp overnight with her family, enjoying the many forests that she was lucky enough to live nearby. Whenever Brittany wasn't enjoying the outdoors, she was either excelling in school or working hard outside of the classroom. From the age of 16, she juggled two jobs alongside her schoolwork, one being at the local Verne's Pizzeria, and the other at the German Concordia Club. Brittany was social, charming, and had a smile that could win almost anyone over and was praised by colleagues and customers alike for her never-ending positive attitude. Now, this may come as no surprise whatsoever, but Brittany was also very popular in the classroom, and despite being the outdoorsy type, she also loved clothing and fashion. And I know I say this quite often, but I genuinely mean it when I say that Brittany was the perfect daughter. She loved her friends and her family alike, and was deeply involved in her community. Now, unfortunately, you likely know where this story is going. And so, on that note, I need to introduce you to one of her friends, Cheyenne Rose Antoine. Now, in comparison to Brittany, Cheyenne was not cut from the same cloth. While Brittany's family loved and accepted her, Cheyenne's parents were tragically abusive. 
They grew up attending Canadian residential schools, institutions created to take Indigenous children away from their families and enroll them in Christian boarding schools to help them assimilate into Canadian culture. Many reports highlight significant abuse that went on at these schools, with some reporting thousands of deaths across the schools over a multi-decade period. Naturally, the students there, much like Cheyenne's parents, were subjected to massive amounts of trauma. As a result of the trauma they endured as children, Cheyenne's parents turned to drug usage to cope with the horrors they experienced. And by the time Cheyenne's mother gave birth to her, she was sadly hooked and unable to stop using. At the age of two years old, Cheyenne was taken into foster care, where she stayed there until the age of 18. During this time frame, she was reportedly physically and sexually abused on multiple occasions, unable to escape from the system that was designed to help her when no other place would. So naturally, by the time that she was 15 years old, Cheyenne was unable to cope healthily with her trauma. And then, moving forward, came even more bad news. Tragically, after years years of drug abuse, her mother would overdose, sending Cheyenne further into a downward spiral of depression and trauma. Her coping method of choice was methamphetamine, among an assortment of other dangerous drugs, and by the time she and Brittany started hanging out, she was very clearly in a very dark place. Saying that, it was reported that, with Brittany's naturally bright demeanour, Cheyenne did seem to be improving herself in her company. The pair of them were often seen hanging out together at the local mall, laughing, joking, and smiling with friends. There was a real possibility that Cheyenne's life could improve with her friend by her side. It is a real shame that, sadly, that would never happen. Now, before we get into the heavy part of today's video, I'd like to introduce you to this video's sponsor, Rocket Money, which has helped finance the special documentaries away from the coffee house. As you may have guessed, I'd recently spent some time away in Australia. Now, we all feel those holiday blues, but on the plus side, I can finally take back control of my diet and my finances. Holidays are great, but they always end up costing more than you'd expect. It makes it quite hard to plan and budget for time away, but thankfully, I've got just the thing which may help you out. Rocket Money is the app you need to save more and manage money better. It safely and securely identifies recurring charges and cancels unwanted subscriptions for you. And with just a couple taps, you can even cancel from within the app. Rocket Money analyzes your spending habits, sets up smart savings, and even negotiates your bills for you, helping you to achieve financial freedom and spend your hard-earned money where it really matters. Did you know that Rocket Money has helped save customers up to $740 a year, and furthermore, has helped with more than $500 million in cancelled subscriptions? Whatever your aspirations are this year, Rocket Money can most likely help you out. Take back control of your finances today, Go to rocketmoney.com slash coffeehousecrime. That's rocketmoney.com slash coffeehousecrime to get started today for free. Now let's get straight back to today's video. In the early hours of March the 25th, Brittany and Cheyenne had plans to go out together for a night of fun, with the intention of hanging out together over a few drinks before possibly meeting friends in town. At midnight and just before heading out, Brittany posed with Cheyenne for a photo to post on her Facebook page. Within this image, they showed off their outfits and excitement for the evening to come. Tragically, little did anyone know at the time that this would be the last photo of Brittany alive. According to Cheyenne, after taking this photo, the two girls then headed out to town, first travelling to the Manchester Brew Pub on the corner of 33rd Street and Idaho Drive, and then, after a few drinks, heading to a house party on Avenue 1, where they met up with several of their friends. By now, both Cheyenne and Brittany had had several drinks together, and by Cheyenne's account, the night had started to get pretty hazy for both of them. At around 4am, the girls then left the house party before before heading to the Colonial Pub on 8th Street. Now, according to Cheyenne, Brittany had asked an unknown man if she could borrow his lighter. The two then quickly started chatting, and before Cheyenne knew it, he had joined them for drinks. And apparently, Brittany and that man then suddenly disappeared after this. Cheyenne didn't even get to learn his name, let alone where the two had gone. After separating, Cheyenne then travelled downtown to see her uncle at the local supported living centre named The Lighthouse officially ending her night. While there with her uncle, Cheyenne posted on Brittany's Facebook page to say, Where are you, Brittany? I haven't heard from you. 
Obi get back home safe, I need my phone, love ya. Yet, not even two hours later, at 6am, it became very evident that something terrible had happened to Brittany. In the early hours of March 26, 2015, emergency operators received a 911 call that would soon shock the town of Saskatoon. Just outside of town and on a rural street called Valley Road, a young woman's body had just been found near the Cedar Villa Estates. Over the phone, the caller said that the woman appeared to be completely lifeless, and her skin was growing cold. The woman was found wearing no shoes and lying flat on her back. When police arrived, it immediately became clear that the cause of her death was asphyxiation by strangulation, and judging by the state of her body, first responding officers determined that it must have been placed there only one hour earlier, more specifically, between the time of 5.20 and 5.40 a.m. With no wallet or ID, officers could not immediately determine who the victim was. In an effort to identify her, the authorities released an image of a star tattoo located on her left hand, and a lion tattoo which was found on her shoulder. Detectives also found a woman's black braided belt next to her body, which was photographed and then released to the public. This was a very important item, as it was soon determined to be the instrument used to choke her. Soon after the photos were released to the public, Saskatoon PD received a phone call with potential information related to the murder, and surprise surprise, it was Cheyenne. Fighting through tears, Cheyenne identified the body to belong to her friend, Brittany, and was quick to tell the authorities everything she knew in hopes of aiding the investigation. She ran through the entire previous night, telling them everything that we already know so far, this including the Facebook photo, the house party, the bar, and that unknown man. She was then rather persistent to tell the authorities that she ended her own night at the lighthouse, with her uncle even confirming her alibi. Now, it became quite clear that the police needed to know who this anonymous man was, and so they did the obvious thing by going down to the colonial pub to review that surveillance footage. But when they arrived, they did not find what they were hoping or even expecting. It turns out that neither of the girls were there that night, and furthermore, no surveillance footage or witnesses could confirm Cheyenne's story. So, Cheyenne was lying, and if she was lying, what else could she be hiding? Back at the lighthouse, officers were quick to check the surveillance footage to see if Cheyenne ever made it back as she claimed. Well, they were rather shocked to discover that this too was a lie, and she had never arrived there as she previously stated. Now, instead of confronting Cheyenne about their discovery, the authorities went to speak to her uncle instead, and after informing him that his story did not align with the surveillance footage, he was relatively quick to change his tune. He now claimed that Cheyenne had told him about two black men who were smoking weed in a motel. Apparently, she and Brittany had actually spent time with them instead of going to the colonial pub, and that is when a fight between the four suddenly broke out all over cocaine. Cheyenne fled to the bathroom when things heated up. Once the commotion died down and she felt safe enough to look outside of the room, she was greeted with the horrible sight of Brittany's lifeless body face down on the bed. Allegedly, the men then pointed a gun at her and forced her to help them take care of the body. After letting her go, they threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone. Soon after this, she fled to her uncle for help. Now, despite her confession to her uncle, Cheyenne was unable to tell him where this motel was, or the names of the people who had killed her friend. After all, she was apparently just lucky enough to have escaped with her life. While investigators knew that this story was, quite bluntly, full of shit, they decided to keep quiet as they resumed their investigations, because thankfully, they didn't have to worry about Cheyenne. And that's because she was newly arrested and put into custody over a separate charge related to drugs and shoplifting. Now, this wasn't unusual behaviour for her either, because at the age of 21, she had already racked up more than 50 separate charges throughout her lifetime, and this didn't bode well for her story with Brittany. Investigators would take the opportunity to speak to Cheyenne every single time she landed herself in custody, but over the months, she was becoming extraordinarily uncooperative over Brittany's death. Fast forward half a year, and Brittany's killer still hadn't been found, yet they knew that there was more to uncover with Cheyenne, but unfortunately, they had no solid evidence to go by. 
But what if I told you that the clue they so desperately needed had been staring at them right in the face ever since the very beginning? And even worse, they wouldn't realise for quite a while longer. On the half-year anniversary of her friend's death, Cheyenne commented on their final photo together. In this comment, she said, I miss you so much, Bert. I wish heaven had visiting hours so I could come to see you, but I'm so glad you came and visited me in my dream last night. I am blessed to have met you and have you be part of my life. I will cherish and hold all of our good memories we've had over the years. Looking forward to the day that I see you again. Rest in paradise, my angel. Now, I've skipped past the drivel because that is not important in this photo, but rather, it is this belt found right here. You see, Cheyenne clearly wanted people to see how upset she was. However, only a few days after this, Brittany's family would call the authorities with information that blew the entire case wide open. Cheyenne's aunt had recently contacted them with new information on the day that Brittany was murdered. According to Cheyenne's aunt, in the early hours of that fateful morning, Cheyenne had run up to her house drunk, hysterical, and crying for help. She told her aunt that she and Brittany had gotten into an argument that had sadly escalated beyond her control. She then admitted to having hit Brittany over the face with an object, before choking her until she was unresponsive. Cheyenne's aunt then looked out past the open door and noticed Brittany inside the car that Cheyenne had arrived in. Brittany appeared to be badly beaten, slumped over in her seat, bleeding, and completely unresponsive. While visiting her aunt, Cheyenne never mentioned a motel or anyone else that evening. Furthermore, she made it quite clear that she was the one to assault Brittany. She then took off, drunkenly running towards the car before speeding off into the darkness, taking Brittany in the passenger seat beside her. Now, deep down, Cheyenne's aunt knew that her niece was guilty, but initially was too scared to go to the authorities. I mean, this was a lot for her to grapple with and she wasn't even sure if what she had seen could be trusted. Cheyenne was family after all, and she didn't want to be the one to strike her down in court, but as time ticked by, her inner conscience weighed in. Despite this fresh testimony, Cheyenne continued to deny any involvement whatsoever. Unfortunately, the authorities were still unable to pin her down with any substantial evidence either. And as time passed by, it was looking less likely to ever materialise. However, in the year 2017, and two years after Britney's murder, that was finally about to change. So, do you remember the photo of Britney and Cheyenne on the night that she was murdered? Well, it was at this moment that an investigator reanalyzing the photo found something incredibly substantial. Found towards the bottom left of the photo, and barely in the frame, was a black braided belt. Of course, that was the very same belt that had been found lying next to Brittany's body, and was also determined to be responsible for her death. The belt was taken out of storage and carefully analyzed, and sure enough, Cheyenne's DNA was found to be all over it. And so finally, after two long years of trying to pin her down, they had the evidence they finally needed against her. And only days later, Cheyenne was arrested on charges of second degree murder. Cheyenne knew that the game was over and was rather quick to give her final version of events to officers. But this would only come after initially remaining stoic and silent for several hours. Cheyenne confessed everything. She admitted that shortly after leaving the house party with Brittany, with both of them being heavily intoxicated from alcohol and drugs, the two then made their way to McDonald's for a late night bite to eat. That is when apparently the two girls argued over a mobile phone on the way. Cheyenne claimed that she blacked out shortly after this, and was unable to recall Brittany's final moments. But apparently, when she woke up, she knew that she had done something horribly wrong. While it was evident that Cheyenne was responsible for Brittany's death, it never became clear what the intention behind the murder was. The prosecution initially gunned for second-degree murder, but without criminal intent, these charges were dropped to manslaughter. In the end, the judge accepted a joint submission from the prosecution and the defense teams, sentencing Cheyenne to seven years behind bars after she pleaded guilty to manslaughter. Which I think is a total cop-out, to be honest. Motive or not, seven years is barely anything. At the end of the day, she murdered her best friend, and she had so much to live for. Seven years is absolutely nothing. Quite understandably, Brittany's family were not happy with the outcome. 
In their minds, Cheyenne was off the hook in only seven years. They also highlighted that Cheyenne could have taken Brittany to a hospital rather than leave her friend die in the street. And this just goes to prove that for the entire time, she was thinking about herself rather than her friend. Judge Gray responded to criticism of the light sentencing by claiming that the seven year sentence does in fact fall into the four to 12 year sentencing range for manslaughter. In her mind, the sentencing was balanced because Cheyenne pled guilty and showed remorse for her actions. But what many find frustrating about this case is that Cheyenne knowingly misled the investigators for two years after the murder, and furthermore, continuously lied to cover her tracks. She would even involve her family members in her web of lies, and even convinced her uncle to vouch for her alibi. Although she expressed remorse through her lawyer and a written statement, it cannot be forgotten how uncooperative cooperative she became to save herself. And so, while Cheyenne Antoine temporarily sits behind bars for her role in the murder of Brittany Gargle's death, her family are still quite clearly angry to say the least. Brittany's family will now have to grapple with the fact that someone they loved so dearly is gone forever. Meanwhile, her killer will be out of prison in no time. Classmates and co-workers alike attest that Brittany was a light in their lives. Always smiling, laughing, and working hard, she was an absolute pleasure to be around and now they would never again be able to enjoy her presence ever again. It's a very sad case really, and even to this day, Cheyenne has not established a motive. As far as we can see, Brittany's death was totally senseless. So, with that in mind, what do you think about this case? And why do you think Cheyenne murdered Brittany? As always, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Just a quick update, but as you can tell, we are now back in the coffee house, and for the foreseeable future, all videos will be right here. Thanks again to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. If you would like to save more and spend less, join the over 5 million members already using Rocket Money today. To learn more, go to rocketmoney.com slash coffeehousecrime, or click the link in the description below. As always folks, if you want to get early access to my videos, check out my Patreon here. You can also follow me on social media, most notably my Instagram here, or alternatively, if you want to get a bag of my coffee, check out classifiedcoffeeco.com. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it today folks. Thank you again so much for watching today, I really do appreciate it. I'll see you again very soon for another video, but until that moment arrives, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.